are who you say you are you'll do what you say you'll do and you'll be who you've always been to us Jesus our hope is in you alone our strength in your mighty name our peace in the darkest day remains Jesus and this we the beginning day of our 
prayer emphasis. It's called uh, half a million motiv- motivation, motivation. Mobilization. I told them this morning, I can't ever remember exactly what it was called, but it, it's enlisting a half a million people to pray from now to the day of Pentecost, which is the first Sunday of June. You picked up devotional guides and all last week. We do have some more available today. They are in short supply, but if you don't get one, if you'll let us know in the office, we'll make sure that you get a copy. We'd love for you to join with us. Today's devotion is pretty powerful. And I just kept thinking, if that's what's going to lead us on through, then we need to accept the challenge. You know, for months now, we have been building a study around one passage of Scripture. The passage of Scripture, the setting for it, took place when Jesus was asked the question, what's the greatest of all commandments? And Jesus replied, according to Mark chapter 12, Love the Lord your God with all of your heart and with all of your soul and all your mind and all your strength. Now, I have often wondered, you know, how come Jesus didn't use fewer words? Why didn't he just paraphrase it? Why didn't he just say, hey, listen, love God with all that you are and your neighbor as yourself. But instead, he takes the time to list these different things in our life or part of our human existence. Well, that got me to thinking several months back in my prayer time and study that I want to know why. I want to know why he said, love the Lord our God with all of our heart. And so I started researching scripture and oh my goodness, did it open up my eyes. Because I realized what he was saying was, you love him with everything inside You love him with the motivations of your heart. And so if you say, I love God with all my heart, you better examine your motives behind why you do things. And then we need to ask the Lord to purify our ways. Well, that took me into, what does it mean to love the Lord our God with all of our mind? And we saw that this causes us to begin to address our thought life. Why do I think the way I do? And then if we see that our thoughts and our actions and all of these things are not in line with God's holy word, we need to ask the Lord to not just purify our heart, but to cleanse our mind. Well, today, I want us to begin looking at that part, asking the question, what does he mean by loving the Lord our God with all of our soul? Now, in order for us to move forward with that thought, I thought we probably ought to take a step back and just ask ourselves what is meant when we read about the soul in the scriptures. I want us to understand so that we can all be on the same page. Well, what we can find in our studies is that the soul often refers to that moral and emotional part of our human makeup. Now, that doesn't tell us a whole lot, but I went looking and I found that in the Hebrew, this word means breath or possessing life, making the soul the source of, and this is what's important, our human emotion, our will, and our actions. Wow. Loving God with our soul. So with this understanding, hopefully we can begin to see how our soul plays a vital part in our spiritual existence. And it's because of this vital part that it plays, and this is kind of a warning to you, the enemy does not want to just infiltrate our soul as he does our mind and our heart. Instead, He wants to capture it. He doesn't just want to infiltrate. He wants it as his own. He wants to steal our soul from us. And you're wondering, okay, Pastor, well, well, what does this mean? I mean, why does he desire to, to steal our soul? Well, I can tell you it's because our soul is eternal. It is that lasting part of who we are, that lasting part from which we can give God praise and honor and glory and pledge our allegiance to Him. And it's because of this that the origin of our emotion, our will, and our actions needs to be protected and guarded. 
And so what we need to do is we need to go to the Lord and ask Him, number one, to cleanse, purify our heart, mind, and soul, and to fill our souls so that we can live righteous and holy in order to please and honor Him. Now, I have come to the realization that there's a lot of things in life that I, I don't know much about. And I'm sure that we could start making a list of things and I could say, I don't know much about this. And some of you could say, well, I do. And you might say, well, I don't know much about this. And I might be able to say, well, hey, I do. But I believe that when we come upon issues that we can't figure out on our own, let's go to someone who has the knowledge. Well, I have come to understand that a lot of people in here have the knowledge needed for what we are facing today. And so what I did was I went into the New Testament and I looked to a man by the name of the Apostle Peter. Peter seemed to have a great understanding in this truth about the soul. In fact, in the first epistle, the first letter that he writes to fellow believers, he shares these words. First Peter chapter 2 Beginning in verse 11, he says, Dear friends, I urge you as aliens and strangers in the world to abstain from sinful desires which war against your soul. Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. Now up to this point, in the letter that Peter is writing, he's been explaining to Christian brothers and sisters their responsibility to live pure lives in the midst of an impure world. That's a good, that's a good encouragement for us, isn't it? That's something we all need to hear. It's something that we all need to study as well. But when we get to this point where he's writing... Our, our text, what we've just shared, he's beginning to point out some difficulties as to why it's not easy to have a life that lives up to that responsibility. And he begins to talk to us about the importance of what's happening, that war that's raging inside of us that tries to control our emotions, our will, and our actions. And so what do we do? I've got three very quick truths that I want to share with you that come from this passage. Truth number one is this. Because our soul is eternal, we're basically foreigners in this world. And you're thinking, what does that mean? If you read through different translations of the scriptures, you would see that some will refer to believers as resident aliens. Others will refer to us as strangers. You know, we're living in a place, this is our permanent home, but yet really and truly it's not our permanent home. This may be the residence where we are at this moment, but yet there's somewhere other than this that is our home. Now, you understand as believers what he's referring to, right? He's telling us that as believers, this earth, we may think it's home, but it's temporal. It's not going to last. In other words, we are residents of a different place. We are residents of a place called heaven. That is where we are. Now, if you use this term in the Bible days, it would have been referring to people, especially the Jewish people who found themselves living in places they really didn't want to live. And there were many restrictions that were placed on them, not just political, not just vocational, but there were a lot of religious restrictions placed on them. And in our world today, we're seeing that happen more and more, are we not? We're seeing restrictions put upon individuals who claim to be Christians. Because if you live as a Christian and you say things that are in accordance with God's Word, you're labeled, you're cast aside, you're, you're, you're considered someone who's just not a good person. This is what Peter is referring to. And so he's starting to tell these people, if you really and truly want to follow Christ, you better understand that you're not going to be accepted and received by everyone else. Well, you know... The enemy, because he understands, as we do, that our soul is eternal, 
He's going to put more and more pressure on us. And you're sitting there thinking, we don't need more pressure today, do we? He understands we do not belong here. There is a place that the Lord has gone to prepare for us. That's where our residence really and truly is. Now, a few weeks back, we were studying the mind, and we came across a passage from Paul's letter to the Philippians. And Paul kind of touched on this when he was talking about the importance of our mind being in tune with the Lord as opposed to being in tune with the world. But listen to these words and see if you can't see how they begin to, to walk in correlation with one another. It was from Philippians chapter 3. And it begins in the second part of verse 18 where he said, Many live as enemies of the cross. Their destiny is destruction. Their God is their stomach and their glory is their shame. Their mind is on earthly things, but... Our citizenship is in heaven. In other words, we can't buy into the things of the world because the enemy has laid so many traps there for us. As aliens, we live by the rules of God. We live to please our Father. We live as if this place is passing and that place will eventually be our home. Does that make sense? Well, here's the second truth, and it's really kind of brief, but yet it's, it's self-explanatory. Because our soul is eternal, we must be on guard at all times. Now, when you hear someone say that we need to be on guard, it means to, well, prepare for any contingency that may come up. Now, when I say that, we usually... Well, it usually conjures up images of us taking a defensive position, right? I mean, we're behind the, the walls, the doors are locked, the gates are locked. You know, we're ready, we're watching, we're waiting. But you know what it should say to us is we need to concentrate on defending our soul against the attacks of the enemy. And you say, well, pastor, how do we do that? Well, the apostle Peter was a little more brief in his explanations than Jesus was. Jesus went into detail about you need to love with these areas and you can check them off as you love God. But Peter basically sums it up in verse 11 when he says, abstain from evil desires which war against your soul. That's what you do. You have to be on guard. And you say, well, how do I know what's right and what's evil? That's why we have this. That's why we have the Holy Spirit to minister to us, to talk to us. Peter doesn't go into a lot of specifics. It's just basically, hey, protect yourself against sin. It's kind of like the old timers used to say, we have to come to the place where we settle the question and we leave no doubts as to where our allegiance lies. That brings us to the third truth, which is this. Because our soul is eternal, we need to live to glorify God. Live to glorify God. In verse 12, Peter says, Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God. Now, do you think Peter had ever heard those words before? Do you think he had heard someone teaching the importance of living a godly life so that people see your actions, deeds, all of these things, attitudes that you may glorify God? I can tell you a time that he heard it. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 16, Jesus was teaching His disciples, teaching others. And He says these words, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. You see what it's saying to us? In all that we do, we are a reflection of the family. People will know by the way we live to whom we belong. And you say, well, pastor, is that really? Absolutely that is true. You know, I've got five little grandchildren. If you want to see pictures, I've got about 10,047 on my phone. And I'll be glad to sit down with you and show you every one of them, tell you everything cute they've ever done. 
I've got three beautiful little granddaughters, and those granddaughters are just like their mamas. When I look at them, and that's a good thing, when I look at them, when I hear them, when I see their actions, when I see them walk, and it's just they are my daughters made all over again. Then I've got two grandsons. Now I tell you, that was a joy, having grown up in a house of four kids being the only guy. Having children, but no guys around with me. Bringing on two son-in-laws, but they're son-in-laws, you know. And so when my grandsons came around, it's like, wow. But you know, I was at a tennis match one day. My grandson Landry, sitting right down here with Deanna, was playing tennis. And I was watching him, and I watched him as he walked. I watched him as he, as he was swinging the racket all. And you know, his daddy's a tennis coach. And I kept thinking, oh my goodness, he is a miniature Michael Bischoff. I mean, he could walk, and I thought I would recognize him anywhere. Well, later that day, I went to a baseball game to watch my other grandson play. And Ethan had gotten ahead, and he was rounding second and then third, and he was coming from home, and I hear two guys behind me. One of them said, who does he run like? And the other one said, Matt Falwell. <laughs> and I turned and looked, and I said, that's Easton Falwell. That's Matt's son. That's my grandson. I said, how did you know? They said, we played baseball with Matt. We, could, we recognized that run. Straight up, short steps, but fast. And you know, I walked away from there feeling proud at my grandchildren, my beautiful little granddaughters, my two grandsons. But I thought, you know what? We carry a family resemblance everywhere we go. We can say, I am a child of God. But our actions may say something completely different. We can say, I love God with all that I am, but if we really love God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, then our life is going to show it. People are going to see our actions, our reactions, because it is a reflection of our family, both earthly family and eternal family. How we act, how we carry ourselves, how we behave. And you know what that should do to us? That should cause us to love God so much that our emotions, our wills, our actions crave to be like Him. That should be our heartbeat and passion as Christians, as believers, as followers of Christ. And when we begin to live that way, we are free to live in such a way that will honor God and bring glory to His name and make others long to have that relationship with the Father like you have. I heard an evangelist many years ago ask the question that still rings in my ears. If you were a non-believer watching someone just like you, would it make you want to be a Christian? I'm talking about all the time, not just at church. If they could read your mind, your thoughts, if they knew your heart, your motives, would they desire to follow Christ? Today, let's resolve in our heart to love the Lord our God with all of our emotion, will, soul. Let me pray for us. Jesus, this morning... We have been honored to be here, honored to worship with people that we know and love and appreciate, honored to be able to look at these young men and young ladies as they have grown and completed educations in some situations and looking forward to different opportunities in others. We've been honored, Lord, in our own life in so many ways that we have felt unworthy but yet we're thankful for 
But most of all this morning, Jesus, we are honored to be in your presence. <clears throat> and the reason that we're so honored is because we know the sacrifice you made for us. We are often, Lord, left speechless at the thoughts that a loving, mighty God would invite us to come and be a part of the family. We don't ever want to take that for granted, Lord. Instead, we want to make a commitment that we are going to love you with all that we are. With every part of our being, we're going to love you and endeavor to serve you. Lord, there may be some here this morning that are beginning to come to that realization that they need to draw closer to you. Maybe they need to ask you to allow them to join the family. Maybe they've never become a believer before. I pray that in the closing moments of this service that you would grant opportunity for some to come and open their heart and say, Jesus, I want to love you with all of my soul. We know some are going to watch this later online. And, and Lord, no matter where we are, our cars and in our homes or on the jobs, we know that these words of your holy word can pierce our heart, cause us to, to reflect on our own life. Lord, would you lay it upon us to find a place of prayer where we can just surrender it all to you and say, Jesus, I, I want to serve you. I want to be yours. Lord, would you just guide and direct us now? For we ask these things in your mighty name. Amen. Great is thy faithfulness, O God, my Father. There is no shadow of turning with thee. Thou changest not thy compassions, they fail not. As thou hast been, thou forever will be. Great is thy faithfulness, great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning, new mercies I see. Lord, on 
into.